An announcement was made on December 14th by NASA and Google. So two new exoplanets have been found, have been discovered, said the announcement, thanks to NASA's collaboration with Google's artificial intelligence. One of those in today's announcement is Kepler-90i, which is an eighth planet found orbiting the sun-like star Kepler-90. This makes it the first system discovered with an equal number of planets to our own solar system. That, of course, is since we kicked Pluto out, and it's no longer a, a planet, that's otherwise it would still not be equal. But since we did kick out Pluto, um, we are, we are, there are now two known systems with eight planets. Uh, it's close by, a mere road trip away, at 2,545 light years from Earth. Kepler 90i orbits its host star every 14.4 Earth days with a sizzling surface temperature similar to Venus of 426 degrees C. So uh, not a nice place to visit. And you know, those of you with nothing better to do as the lecture's going on and who brought your calculators, you can figure out how long it'll take the Tesla Roadster to reach this system. Uh, and then report back at the end. Uh, okay, so these new exoplanets are added to the growing list of known worlds found orbiting other stars. And those of you who have attended some of these lectures before, we always have uh, a big turnout and, and a very popular topic when we talk about the Kepler uh, Space Telescope and the amazing discoveries it's found. And those of you who've heard me up here before talk about it know that my feeling is that the Kepler Space Telescope and the Kepler mission has been among the most profound in all of NASA missions because of the way it is permanently and completely transformed our perspective on our place in the universe. So an amazing, an amazing uh, mission. The new solar system rival uh, provides evidence that a similar process occurred within the Kepler-90 uh, star system that formed our very own planetary neighborhood, small terrestrial worlds, worlds close to the host star, and larger uh, gassy planets further away. But to say the system is a twin of our own solar system is a stretch. So tonight, we meet SETI data scientist and Kepler science team member, Jeff Smith, and we also meet Chris Chalou, who's a senior research software engineer on the Google AI team and who led the effort to train AI algorithms to mine the Kepler data. So they're going to uh, entertain you and wow you and inspire you tonight to talk about this new discovery and how artificial intelligence was leveraged for this, uh, this purpose. And um, uh, my good friend and colleague, Franck Marchis, planetary scientist at the Institute, will uh, introduce our speakers with their biographies and will also host a discussion uh, after the presentations. And uh, then a final little announcement on behalf of somebody in the audience um, before I turn this over to Franck. Those of you who are space, uh, you know, launch junkies, tomorrow morning at 6.17 a.m. Uh, out of Vandenberg, a Falcon 9 will be launching. So it's possible if the skies are clear and you're up that early that you might be able to, you know, get out uh, even around here and a few minutes after launch uh, see that streaking across the sky. So tomorrow, 6.17 a.m., Falcon 9. And with that, Frank, I'll leave it to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you, Bill. We're short. It was very short, thank you. <laughs> so I heard that we are kind of slow to start this talk, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a very short introduction. My name is Frank Marchis. I'm a researcher at the SETI Institute, and I'm going to be hosting this uh, uh, SETI talk today. Today we're going to talk about how um, artificial intelligence can help astronomers and why we need artificial, uh, artificial intelligence in today's modern astronomy. And for this purpose, I invited these two um, remarkable researchers. The first one is uh, Jeffrey Smith. Um, Jeff is a researcher at the SETI Institute. He's a data scientist at the SETI Institute. He's basically dedicated most of his career at the SETI Institute to develop pipeline to search for signals of transiting exoplanets in the Kepler data. Um, but in fact, I discovered today that Jeff did not come, did not study astronomy right away. He decided uh, first to study the, um, the physics of particle accelerators, and he did his PhD at Cornell on this topic, specifically on the, on the design of the International Linear Collider, which is a 22-mile-long electropositron accelerator that, is, that will complement the discovery of the LSC. So after joining the institute, uh, Jeff worked on the Kepler data, data analysis, but it also, he also now very interested in using his expertise to um, uh, develop the pipeline for the test mission. And he's going to talk about this, of course, during his talk. 
The second speaker is uh, not an astronomer, per se. His name is uh, Chris Chaloux. He's a senior uh, research software engineer at Google, not too far away from here in Mountain View. Um, his research is mostly focused on machine learning techniques for identifying planets in data, collect in data coming from the Kepler spacecraft. But uh, Chris also works at Google, so he's also interesting in using machine learning for plenty of applications, such as image cap captioning, natural language modeling, and, um, and he also been working on the, uh, Google Ads. So when you see an ad on the side of your screen when you are on Google uh, the Gmail, that's because of Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> But I, I should also mention that Chris, uh, before joining uh, Google, was teaching, studying, and researching mathematics. So please uh, join me in welcoming our two speakers, and we're going to start with Jeff. Hello, everyone. So I'm here to discuss the simple little problem we have of finding tiny planets 600 trillion miles away from Earth. And this is actually more difficult than it sounds. <laughs> so. I work on the test mission. As Frank said, I work on the team that develops the signal processing and transit detection algorithms. Before that, we worked on Kepler, and they're both very similar missions, both searching for extrasolar planets. But there are some differences. Uh, first of all, TESS is going to launch. I, right now, the plan is in April. We'll, we'll see, but that's, that's the current plan right now. And there are many similarities between them, but I'm going to show a couple of the differences. First of all is the size. So this is a NASA mission design model. Conveniently, with mock astronauts and scientists, you can see the scale. And it's a little tiny thing. It's, it's about the size of a human. It's about that tall. And this is in contrast to Kepler, which was about the size, of the size of a school bus. So it's a little tiny thing. It has four little telescopes in there. Each telescope is small enough you could hold it, cradle it in your hands. So it's, it's a little thing. However, it's going to be serving a, surveying a much larger section of the sky than Kepler. So this is a short video. As I mentioned, it has four cameras. The four cameras are set up in such a way so you can have this huge 90-degree field of view. So at any one time, TESS is going to be searching at a 90-degree sector of the sky. It's going to search at that section for about 27 days, looking at the stars, trying to find planets. Then it's going to rotate, look at another section of the sky, again, for 27 days, rotate again. 27 days. Over the course of an entire year, it's going to cover an entire uh, hemisphere. It's start, going to start with the southern hemisphere of the sky. There's also going to be this region right at the top of continuous viewing zone for it's going to collect data for an entire year. Once it's done, it's going to flip over and do the, entire th the same thing again for the southern, or actually the northern hemisphere. Once it's done, it's going to have almost a complete survey of the sky. There's going to be a couple slivers there where it's not going to see things, but for the most part, it's going to be a complete survey of the sky. So there is another big difference between Kepler and TESS. Kepler was essentially a statistical mission. It was to calculate the frequency of Earth-like planets in the galaxy. And Kepler has been a resounding success in that regard. TESS is more of a cherry-picking mission. It's searching for the nearest Earth-like planets, really any planets we can find, but Earth-like are the most interesting. And it's only going to look out tens to a couple hundred light years away. And the critical thing here is that these planets are going to, and these star systems are going to be so close, it's going to be much easier to do follow-up measurements. So we can detect, measure the mass of these planets and therefore the density, see if they're rocky planets or not. And then eventually we can measure the atmospheres of these planets and hopefully someday detect biosignatures in these planets or in the atmospheres. But before we do that, we got to find the planets. So I'm going to show you a simple video. You may have seen this video. It's been around for a while, but it's just a very good video showing you the basic idea of how we detect planets. So you're going to stare at a star, and then you're going to collect the entire amount of light, the total brightness from that star. Then as a planet passes in front of it, as you can see there, the total amount of light or flux from the star is going to dip down a little bit. The, ratio, the, uh, the depth of that transit is going to be proportional to the ratio of the little planet and the size of the star. So you know the size of the star, you know the size of the planet. And then after one orbit of the planet, if it comes around again, you're going to see another dip. And if you see this periodic dip, that's the telltale signal that there's a planet transiting the star. And well, 
in a way, that's it. That's all we do. You know. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more difficult than that. And the reason we're here is to discuss ways that machine learning can aid in the discovery process. So in order to do that, I'm going to tell you how we really detect planets. It's, it's a little bit more involved, so, but let's see if I can summarize this. So I'm going to start with the beginning, at least from a data perspective, and that's the CCD array. So as most telescopes, or many telescopes, you have a CCD array that's collecting the light. And this is a step that's kind of passed over a lot, but it's actually absolutely critical. This is a raw image from Kepler. This is a raw CCD image, and you see all kinds of junk in there. You see a bleeding star that's, that's a, a bleeding current into uh, pixels around it. You see uh, video crosstalk. You see uh, uh, issues with readout errors. You see flat fielding errors. There's all kinds of junk in here. And before you do anything, you got to get this out. So I would love to discuss it. It would be an hour-long talk on its own. So I'm just going to say, poof, and it goes away. <laughs> Once you do that, you have a nice, clear view of the night sky. And now we can actually start searching for things in this calibrated image. But don't forget that. That's really important. It's always skipped over. So now that we're looking at the CCD array, and this is real Kepler data again. There's no real test data because it's not launched yet. Uh, we're going to pick some stars in here that we really want to look at. And well, that looks like a good one. Let's look at that one. So we're going to pick some pixels around it, figure out what's the good pixels to find. And then we're going to collect all the light from that star. And we're going to create this light curve. And we're going to look at it for at least 27 days, if not for a year. We're going to collect this. We're going to bring down the light curve. And it looks like that. Not what you want to see. Now, there could be transits in here, maybe possibly. But they're obscured by all this other crap that's going on. And well, all this crap's actually coming from the spacecraft. Because when I mentioned that we're staring at a section of the sky, and we're, we're pointing really well, we're not moving, because we have really good reaction wheels that do not break. But <laughs> even so, in reality, it's really going like that. It's shaking around. There's all this stochastic noise. And occasionally, we're not pointing where we think we are. And we have to do an attitude tweak and put it back. And in addition to that, we're staring at a section of the sky, and the sun's moving relative to it. So, Different sections are heating up and cooling down, so there's thermal expansion and thermal contraction that causes the optics of the telescope to expand. So you have focus changes, and you get all these long-term drifts. You get something that looks like this. And this is huge compared to the little tiny transits we want to see. Fortunately, oh, this is just a video of it coming out of focus. Fortunately, all this crap can be characterized. And we can identify what's going on in each one of these cases. And we can remove it. We can remove it very well. I, I would love to discuss it, but we don't have time. So I'm just going to say, magic. And it goes away. And now we have a nice, clean light curve. And you can see the transits just dangling down underneath it. And a discovery, right? Well, not necessarily. Because just because we see something that looks like a transit doesn't mean it actually is a transit. Because the stars are working against us, too. Stars are not glowing orbs in the sky. They're giant fusion reactors, and they're pulsating and vibrating, and many of them are giving off flares all the time. And in addition to that, you could be staring at a star, and just over its corner, there could be an eclipsing binary, because binary star systems are all over the place. And you can't resolve that from the star you're looking at, so when you look at the total light curve, it looks like there's a little tiny Earth-like transiting planet, but it's actually a giant star that's eclipsing way in the distance. So you got to know very well what's going on in the sky around what you're looking at. So in summary, we can search for planets, and we can search for Earth-sized planets, but only if we properly calibrate the CCD image, if we properly collect all light from each star, if we properly remove all instrumental artifacts in the light curves, and if we properly account for all stellar objects around each star and know how they are behaving. Then and only then can we actually find the planets. And even though we're, we're really good, we don't necessarily always do this right. And sometimes you get little residual artifacts in there that look like planets, and they're really not. And that's the challenge. So, but say that we can remove all of this, and you're going to get a light curve, something like this, and you can see the nice transits dangling down. And, and again, if that's all it was, we can all go home. There's, we can do this. The problem is, is the Earth-sized planets, the interesting ones, make a light curve like that. And this is simulated test data. There's an Earth-sized planet in there. I can't see it. I'm guessing you can't either. Fortunately, there are rather sophisticated 
algorithms that can detect these little tiny weak signals. I would love to discuss it, but we can't. I'm just going to say we can detect them. And there they are, and I bet you, couldn't, you didn't guess there were that many in there. So we process all this data in the test pipeline, just like Kepler, and we develop these huge reports with all this information in it. I'm not going to explain all of this, of course. But we can characterize the transit, and we can you know, fit this fed red line to it and think we have an idea of what it is. And again, if all the planets look like, or all the transits look like this, there'd be no problem. This is, this is simple. Problem is, is, the interesting ones look like this. Here's a light curve, simulated test data, and it, the pipeline detected three transits, and if you phase fold at the right period, you can that transit, well, okay, it kind of pops out. And the pipeline says this is about a two Earth radii planet, 377 degree uh, equilibrium surface temperature. And so is it? Is, is this really a detection? Well, in this case, it's not. This is just a background eclipsing binary. This is just one of the things I was talking about before. So forget about that one. Here's another example. Detected lots of transits. We phase fold it, and yeah, okay, you can kind of see something there. Pipeline again says about a little bit over a two Earth radii planet, radius planet. Is this real? This one's real. This is a planet. This is a successful detection. Here's another example. Looks very similar to the one I showed before. You could barely see any type of uh, signal there whatsoever. Pipeline says it's a 0.78 Earth radii planet. This is smaller than the Earth. This is a paper. It's not a paper. This is random noise. This is just chance correlations of the data. There's not really anything there. Here's another example. Looks just like the previous one. Pipeline says this is a 0.4 Earth radii planet. But it can't possibly be. This is just noise again, right? This is a planet. This is a successful detection. So this gives you an idea of the challenge we have here. We have all this data, we collect all these signals, and then we got to figure out what's real or not. And every 27 days, we're going to be collecting all of these signals, and then we got to vet these, and we got to classify them and figure out what is interesting enough to do follow-up measurements, ground-based measurements, to confirm that they really are planets, and which ones are just junk. And the thing is, it's going to make this more difficult for Tess and Kepler, is that we got to do this every month. Kepler, we collected data for four years, and we've been collecting and analyzing it ever since. This, every month we want to do this and find what are real and what are just some other artifact in the data. So on that note, I thank you very much, and I want to pass the mic over to Chris to give you an example of a particular machine learning method that helps in this exact problem. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So uh, since the topic of uh, tonight's presentation is searching for exoplanets with AI, I thought it would be a good place to start by asking what exactly is AI. So AI is uh, simply a term that means making machines smart. Um, there's lots of ways we can do this. Um, I could write a computer program that would be very good at playing tic-tac-toe, for example. Uh, I could do that by just programming in uh, what move to make at every possible position on the tic-tac-toe board. Uh, but on the other hand, um, another approach you can take to AI is machine learning, which is uh, a set of techniques that allow uh, the machine to actually learn rules for itself from data, as opposed to humans programming in the specific rules. Now, there's many different approaches to machine learning, and I won't go into them all today. Um, but there's a particular type of machine learning that um, I focus my research on, and, and that's called artificial neural networks. Uh, so what is an artificial neural network? Uh, have we um, successfully recreated the human brain? Uh, the answer is no, we have not, <laughs> um, although the media uh, sometimes like to run with that angle. Um, the, the reason for the name artificial neural networks is because the the uh, technology actually did uh, originate back in the 1940s as a method to um, actually study and try and understand uh, the human brain. But more recently in computer science, we've actually been using these uh, artificial neural networks uh, not to, to study or replicate the brain, but to solve uh, a host of other um, practical tasks. So, 
artificial neural networks, I mentioned they sort of, um, the research sort of began in the 1940s, and for, for many decades it was sort of a niche area of research, up until about five or six years ago, when uh, suddenly the interest really took off, and now uh, most of the tech companies here in Silicon Valley have entire research departments devoted to artificial neural networks. So, uh, what happened? Well, the story is best explained um, through the ImageNet Image Classification Challenge. So this is a yearly challenge run by the Computer Vision Group at Stanford and uh, some other groups as well. And the challenge is um, they're going to give you a, a training set of 1.2 million images. And these images are going to be things like apples and tennis balls. There's 100 different categories that these images could be in. And your challenge is to use these 1.2 million images to train some sort of um, model to successfully label uh, new images. There's 150,000 images that you don't have the labels for. And so the challenge is who can train the system to uh, achieve the best accuracy on these 150,000 images? And so before you think this problem is too easy, um, here is uh, an example of uh, two of the classes uh, in this training set. Alaskan Malamute and Siberian Husky, they look very similar to me, um, but these are two different classes. Uh, and you'll notice that the dogs are in all sorts of weird uh, poses and positions and different backgrounds. And uh, additionally, there's uh, 16 different classes of carpenter's plane <laughs> in the uh, data set. Uh, these all look very similar to me, but they're uh, all very different categories. So it's quite a challenging uh, task in, in computer vision. So the very first year of this challenge was 2010, and this was uh, September 2010, so it was just over seven years ago, which is uh, generations ago in, in the machine learning community. Um, so this was before neural networks really had their recent explosion, and the winning um, team got 28.2% uh, error. This is top five error, because uh, under the rules of the competition, the um, the, each system gets five guesses for each image because sometimes there could be multiple uh, images or multiple different objects in each image. So in 2010, the winner got 28% um, error. And then in 2011, this is still before the neural network explosion, um, the winner you know, made some improvement and got 25.8% error. And then 2012 came along, so this is just, just over five years ago, and... Um, this paper came out, uh, it's called AlexNet, and this was a neural network um, that cut the error down all the way down to 16.4%. Uh, this was work done by uh, Alex Krzyzewski and others at the University of Toronto, that's why it was called AlexNet. Uh, this really fueled this um, revolution in machine learning that um, made neural networks become uh, really, really popular. And so, since 2012, the winner of this competition every year has been a neural network. And so, what happened? Well, in 2013, the, uh, the, the next neural network came out that cut the error down to 11.7%. 2014, 6.7%. Uh, uh, and at this point, um, someone named Alex, uh, Andre Karpathy decided to see how well a human would do at this challenge. <laughs> So he, uh, he wrote a very entertaining blog post about this, but he actually uh, sat down and trained himself on these uh, <laughs> 1,000 categories. There's like 120 different species of dog, um, 16 types of carpenter's plane and so forth. And he managed to get 5.1%. So it was a win, win for the humans um, <laughs> until 2015. <laughs> when um, the next model came out with 3.4%, uh, um, and then 2016, 3.08%, and finally last year, the error came down to 2.25%. So in the past seven years, this is the sort of uh, progress that has been made in um, com computer vision. Uh, and that's, it's been driven by neural networks. So in this time, um, uh, everyone has become really excited about neural networks, and they've really become uh, very mainstream. I'm not sure if you've uh, heard of them before, but they actually power um, many of the technologies you would use every day. Um, so I've got some, uh, some Google products there that you might be familiar with, 
But um, another, um, uh, another area which I think is really exciting is in medical imaging. So neural networks have been shown to accurately um, diagnose diabetic retinopathy um, and also accurately uh, detect uh, tumors, um, cancerous tumors in biopsies of the lymph nodes. And in both cases, they can do that with um, uh, equal or better accuracy than actually trained professionals. Um, so this is actually really exciting. But uh, yeah, so because this talk is about exoplanets, um, you might be able to see where this is going. Um, does it work if we apply the same sort of uh, techniques to signals from the Kepler telescope? So here is an example of a, of a planet from the Kepler telescope. Um, this is a, a nice uh, strong detection like uh, Jeff was showing us before. Um, and we've, well, we've already searched the, the data from the Kepler telescope, right? Um, humans have manually vetted over 30,000 uh, different detected signals from Kepler, and we've confirmed, I think, over 2,500 planets so far, and there's uh, 2,000 more candidates in there that may, in fact, be planets. But there are still more signals in there, uh, potentially. There are signals, like, right on the edge of the uh, detection threshold um, that have not been uh, thoroughly examined by humans. Um, so here's an example. Is this a planet or not? Um, what about this? What about this? These have not um, been uh, closely examined by humans yet. Uh, in fact, um, these last two examples are planets. Um, they're, they're planets that um, our model actually found, but I'll get to that in a couple of slides. So uh, I won't really dwell uh, too much on the, the technical details here, but what we did was we came up with a neural network model um, that takes as input um, these, these light curves uh, that have already been uh, processed and calibrated by the Kepler pipeline that um, Jeff worked on. Um, so they, they take uh, a light curve uh, and they output the probability um, that that light curve is actually a planet. And you'll notice that it actually takes uh, two uh, light curves. There are actually two versions of the same light curve. We found this was one way that we could improve the accuracy of our model. Um, we we uh, include one wide view of the light curve and one zoomed in view of the light curve. Uh, and the zoomed in view gives our model the ability to really uh, look at the shape of the, of the signal and that really gave us a boost in accuracy. Uh, the other thing that we need in machine learning is we need a training set of uh, labeled data to train our model on. And luckily, um, humans have already gone through thousands and thousands of signals from Kepler. So we were able to use these um, to train um, our model. So once our model had trained on these 15,000 signals, we uh, then turned our model to a search of uh, 670 stars from the Kepler data set out of 200,000. Um, and we really did this just, you know, just to sort of test our method and see if we could come up with anything interesting. And in fact, um, we did discover two new planets, um, one of which was the uh, exciting planet Kepler-90i, which um, just so happened to be the eighth planet that was discovered in the Kepler-90 system. So um, I've spoken mainly about Kepler, but what about TESS? So um, I very much hope that we'll be able to apply these, these same techniques um, to the TESS mission. I think one challenge that we're going to have is that uh, because the TESS mission hasn't started yet, we don't have, um, we don't have the ground truth data. We don't have um, these signals from the, the TESS mission that have been classified by humans yet. So the question is whether we'll be able to uh, accurately simulate uh, a training set um, to uh, feed into our model to actually train a model um, accurately enough to, um, you know, for the same technique to work in test data without having the, the big corpus of uh, human classified data. So that's an open question and it's something we are uh, actually talking about working on uh, this year. Cool, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So the next step here is to have um, a basic conversation on what you did and 
In fact, before we go into the science and all the details about the uh, algorithm, et cetera, I have some kind of personal questions for you, but don't worry, not your social security number, nothing like this, just... Jeff, mm -hmm. first of all, um, how did you come to work on Kepler? Why did you take this mission impossible of going for this, developing this pipeline? What motivated you? Uh, well, I, uh, as, as you mentioned before, I started in uh, accelerator physics, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I uh, had always, as the way I, I phrase it, I was looking into the smallest of inner spaces, just looking at the tiniest little things, developing machines that are miles long, if not 22 miles long, searching at these little tiny things. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, Due to funding situations, I decided to start looking for other things. It's still not certain that the International Lunar Collider will be built. If it is, it probably won't be in the US. And so I, I, one option would have been stay in the field. Uh, I could have gone to Geneva, Switzerland, work in the LHC. I was already working on the LHC. Uh, but I, I like California, was one reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I knew somebody that worked on the Kepler mission, and I asked him, you know, do you have anything interesting going on? And, and after speaking to him and other people, I found out that even though the application is completely different, the techniques in many ways are quite similar. And the, the ways that we model the data and simulate the data and fit the data is, is quite similar. So I realized that my skills kind of carried over and I've been here ever since and it's been fun. I so I started in 2010 on Kepler. So basically data is data, data in physics. And if you, you can yeah. translate it quickly from looking at this, looking at the tiny things to looking right. at the stars. So right, well, once it's, once it's ones and zeros, you know, anyways, it's quite similar. And uh, it's um, also, I, it, for me personally, finding, I, I have to have, find good, strong meaning in whatever I'm working on, and searching for some type of discovery is important, and I find searching for extrasolar planets just as significant as searching for, you know, Higgs boson or whatnot. Right. So I have the same question for you, Chris. I mean, you work for Google. Uh, how this idea of using this new technology came out for searching exoplanets? Why you could have done plenty of other things, like characterize dogs, uh, races, <laughs> and why why exoplanets? Um, so I was actually just reading a book in my spare time. It was uh, Human Universe by Brian Cox, <laughs> and. Um, he was talking about uh, the Kepler mission and how many planets had been discovered, but I, I, I definitely remember that one thing he said was that um, in astronomy, like other fields of science, we're now getting to the point where we're collecting more data than uh, humans can analyze manually. I guess the, the traditional way that science was done was that um, astronomers would gather data and then they would examine it themselves. Um, but we're getting to the point now where our technology has sort of uh, outpaced um, uh, how, how quickly, you know, we can actually examine the data as humans. So I just wondered whether uh, anyone has ever tried to apply machine learning to the Kepler data set. And so I, uh, I did a little bit of research online and I found um, uh, an astronomer, Andrew Vandenberg, um, who was at Harvard at the time. And I just sent him an email and said, hey, I'm, I work at Google. <laughs> uh, I work in machine learning. Would you be interested in uh, applying machine learning to the Kepler data set to see if we can discover some planets? And then we started a collaboration that way. Right. So you mentioned you discovered those two exoplanets. Uh, shall we assume that you have more of them that you did not yet mention or revealed? Or this is... Uh, so um, we've, we, we hope to find more. Um, we, we don't have any more that we're holding back at the moment. Um, but what we decided to do um, was, uh, once we had our model, we thought we would just use our model to search a small, uh, a small fraction of the Kepler data to see if we found anything interesting. And so we started with 670 stars, because these were the stars that already had multiple planets discovered around them. And so we figured it was more likely to find additional stars around those planets than if we just searched around other stars. But that's, that's certainly something that uh, we're working on right now, is to apply the same technique to all 200,000 stars. So Jeff, you, um, you basically feed, with this pipeline, you basically feed the machine learning. You, you uh, give them some transit which has been already uh, validated as planets or some artifacts. 
So it means that you're still working on the Kepler data. We're still processing yeah. those data. So there yeah. is some new discovery that we come from you and combining those two, those two works, right? Definitely, yeah. I mean, the, the pipeline work for, for Kepler is basically over, but uh, we, we have this huge data set. And as Chris mentioned, there's a lot of vetted data already where it's already been confirmed if it's a planet and we've already classified things. So there's this huge training set in Kepler and, it's, and a lot more can be done in training a machine learning algorithm to uh, detect even more. And, and really, it's like the examples I showed. Once you get near that noise threshold, it's hard to tell. And whatever you can do to help figure out, is this real or is this just some artifact, would be very useful. And, and lots of times, it's just humans looking at it with their eyeballs. And that only goes so far. And, and as people can appreciate, if you're staring at the moon and see a face in it, we see things that aren't really there. So machines are sometimes better than us in that case. Should we mention to Chris, like a year ago, we had a meeting where we talked about using machine learning to dig into the Kepler data? That was a year ago. And you remember this discussion we had together. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> you were ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> Just. <laughs> so for the test data, um, so this mission is, is not launched yet. It's going to be launched at the end of this year? Uh, April. April of this year is the oh, current April. plan. Okay. So. Um, one of the problems with, mach yeah, with machine learning is that you, you need to train mm -hmm. this algorithm. Mm -hmm. So what solution do we have? Well, we, we would love to use a machine learning algorithm in order to classify the, the transits we detect. And right now, we have a very sophisticated simulator that simulates the night sky and also simulates the instrument. It puts in all the instrumental artifacts and everything. It puts in eclipsing binaries and all the other stuff. And we've been using the simulator to tune our, our algorithms for well over a year now. And so we do have a mechanism to generate a large amount of simulated data with absolute ground truth. And we know what the answer is because we put it in there. And so uh, like Chris was alluding, uh, that you know this this could potentially be very, very useful, but you got to be careful because simulated data never really looks like real data. And but if it's close enough, and if we think we can we can rely on it, then before we actually get real flight data down, we might have a trained algorithm ready to start classifying it. So the goal will be to have like in uh, in every three months a catalog generated automatically by a machine learning algorithm that would be the best for you? Yeah, well, every month, because it's month, every 27 yeah. days for, for tests. Uh, that would be ideal. I mean, one problem is that uh, we need to do uh, ground-based follow-up measurements in order to figure out if these are really planets or not. And they, the, 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 uh, it will set in the sky very early on after tests detects them. And we'll only have a couple months to do the ground-based measurements before they're obscured by the sun. So whatever we can do to speed this up, to, to eliminate all the chaff and figure out what is really interesting that we want to look at, the faster we can do that, the better. So, so are you going to work together on this? Or what's the... Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking. <laughs> all right. So, you, um, so these are detections by transit. But uh, you may know that astronomers are now trying new, te new techniques to look for exoplanets. We try to image them directly, for instance. Uh, one of the projects is a project GPI that I work on. And we have a ton of data, and we have the same problem than you. I mean, we use very complex algorithms to clear the data, et cetera. But then at the end, it's a human being, generally a student or a postdoc who is patient enough to look each at each frames that will identify this tiny dot that could be a planet. So. Maybe there is a new job for you. Maybe you should uh, start thinking about using this same kind of algorithm, but for coronographic observation of uh, exoplanets. Yeah, definitely. I think my first question to you would be, how many labels do we have? Because that's, I think that's, that's the, the big issue. I think in, in astronomy and many areas of science, we, we certainly have the data, we have the machine learning techniques, and we have the, the computational power. But our, our best machine learning techniques require labels. Um, and so labels usually require humans to look at the data first. So what do you mean by labels? Right, Explain so um, in, in the case of, of Kepler, um, the labels, uh, by the labels I mean uh, a collection of signals. Um, and the label for each signal is, uh, yes, this is a planet, or no, this is not a planet. 
Um, and so we need the labels to guide the um, machine learning algorithm during its, its training phase. Um, uh, you know, what, what, what is it actually trying to predict? You know, so in, in this case, we were trying to predict um, whether it was a planet or not. So we needed a, a large set of labeled signals um, that were, were labeled uh, with, yes, this is a planet or no, this is not a planet. Okay, so we do have labels, I think. So maybe we should talk about that. We later. should talk about it. All right. So I have a question which kind of keep me awake for about machine learning and artificial intelligence in general. So I'm going to ask you this, and please feel free to tell me if it's a very stupid question. <laughs> we, we have a program at, at CETI called the FDL that we started th th three years ago, almost now. Um, we start, the goal of the program was to basically introduce artificial intelligence uh, to planetary astronomy, to, to, to solve different problems in astronomy. So when we started this program, I do remember my colleagues were kind of skeptical about it, say, huh, AI, we heard about this. And then after the first year, people get, oh, that's very interesting. We get some interesting results here because we did have, we did manage to solve some of the problems that we had in astronomy. And now we're entering in the third phase where scientists are getting a bit afraid of it. And they're afraid of it because they're saying that we are, with machine learning algorithm, we are breaking the uh, scientific method. You do remember the scientific method is all about solving the problem and by collecting data, and from this data, building a theory, and theory based on physical uh, laws and physical processes and making predictions, right? People who use machine learning, they have a lot of data. They feed the computer with it, and that's the way scientists see it. And then some kind of law, some kind of uh, algorithm, from this algorithm they get, they can predict, but they don't know why. We don't know why this prediction works. We don't understand the underlying physical processes. Some scientists will say that's because we're ignorant and probably there is physical processes that are hidden and we don't see them and we don't understand them. And some other scientists will tell you, well, this is not science. So what do you think of that? Well, that's a wonderful question. I thought about this a lot myself. Uh, I think people give, maybe people won't like me saying this, but I, I think people give humans too much credit <laughs> in some ways. Uh, when we, it is true a lot of people don't trust machine learning and they, they artificial intelligence and they think it's thinking machines and they're, they're doing something that we should be doing and maybe replacing humans. Um, well, first of all, I, people don't trust it because they, they think that they can't read the mind of the machine. You know, I know what I'm doing. I can figure out, oh, I logically, rationally did this, this, and this, and I came to this conclusion. And do you really know that you rationally made all your decisions before you got to your conclusion? I mean, do you actually know all the synapses and everything that happened in your brain to get there? You know, the, the human mind is so complex and we do these convoluted routes to come to some conclusion that if, is, a, is a machine doing some complex neural network in order to come to some conclusion really different than a human using their neural network to come to some conclusion about some problem. And just because a human decided it, does that necessarily mean it's more rational than a machine? And so I, I don't have this fear of artificial intelligence some people do. I, I view it as, as just another tool we use and not necessarily replacing a human or, or doing better than a human. It's just another tool we use to come to a conclusion. What about you, Chris? <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's that's a great point. Um, so I think we're we're certainly at a at a um, at a stage now in in astronomy, say, where you know perhaps it would be great to have um, a million grad students searching the Kepler data, <laughs> looking for planets. Um, but we don't have um, a million grad students, um, so we we need some sort of automated approach. And uh, as our, our current um, state-of-the-art approach for uh, any, um, any automated system that is going to look for certain patterns, um, you know, here I'm even talking about 
identifying images of dogs, uh, different breeds of dogs uh, in photos. Um, the best technique we know of at the moment is machine learning. Um, and that's because, you know, as, as humans, we know what dogs look like, right? Um, but can we program that into a computer? Uh, if, if you think about it, it's actually really hard to do. Because you might try and say, OK, well, a dog is something that has four legs and a tail um, and you know, pointy ears. And then you would sit down and you would try and write some rules as to, you know, well, what do uh, legs look like in photographs? And OK, is it still a dog if one of the legs is sort of uh, hidden behind the other legs? And it turns out to be really, really difficult to um, sit down and write a computer program to actually match those patterns. Um, and so the, yeah, the, the best techniques that we have at the moment are machine learning approaches where we say, OK, we are going to show this system just thousands and thousands of examples of the patterns that we want it to detect. And then uh, in the end, we're going to have a system that does not have rules that we can go and read and, and understand and check. But it is actually going to be um, very, very precise at uh, looking for those patterns that we, that we wanted. And so I think, um, I think like that's why machine learning is, is uh, you know, going to become, I think, um, very important. And there's, there's going to be discoveries that we, we perhaps won't be able to make without machine learning. And I think it would certainly be a shame not to make those discoveries um, because we're, we're worried about, um, you know, um, the fact that we, we can't uh, ask the machine learning model, you know, what it was thinking. Okay. So that's mean that in the future, like in 2040, when I will go to conferences, People will be presenting their result, and they will say, I use this neuronal network, XXX, state a name. And that will be kind of, um, they may have some difficulties to explain the process behind it and the laws, but they will basically give us the, the feeder, the tool they use, and the, uh, and the outcome. But that's not really the scientific method we, we had in mind in the past. They will be, there will be no explanation. So, uh, yeah, so actually there's a lot of work going on at the moment for uh, interpretability and, uh, and understanding of machine learning models. Um, and you actually can, um, in many cases, come up with um, excellent sort of visualizations and, um, and sort of other explanations for why uh, a model made a particular decision. And, uh, certainly, the, the problem is not solved. The task is not completely solved. Uh, there's active research going on. Um, but when, when we trained our model, for example, we fed in uh, certain signals that we knew were planets, and we used uh, some techniques to, um, to try and highlight uh, which portions of the light curve the model was using in its, in its decision. And the model would highlight the transit, which um, gave us some confidence that it had learned which shape was um, uh, was causing it to label this a planet. And then we uh, fed in some uh, various other types of signals that were not planets. Jeff uh, mentioned um, eclipsing binaries. So we fed in an eclipsing binary, and um, when, we, when we visualized uh, that prediction, um, we actually found that it had uh, zoomed in on a, a secondary eclipse. And so we were um, you know, confident in those two cases that the model was looking at the right places in the light curve, at least. You want to add something uh, about yeah, this? Well, I, uh, I guess this might be a little bit different take on it. Um, so you mentioned a scientist going to a conference and presenting their work and saying, well, you know, how did you come to this conclusion? And I said, well, I don't know. You know the machine did it. And uh, how many scientists or engineers know every single aspect of their work? You know, there's plenty of aspects on Kepler that I don't know anything about. I'm not a CCD engineer. I don't know how that all works. But uh, in some parts, you have to believe the experts and that particular aspect, and it's teams of people working on discoveries, and the individual giving the presentation might not necessarily know every aspect of what's going on. And there are machine learning experts, and there are people that understand how these work. And so I, I guess I, 
it already happens that a scientist will present work and they don't actually know how the discovery was made, or at least not every aspect of it. All right, so that's a fair point. <laughs> so the future, basically, the way we should see that, summarize this, is that in the future, machine learning will help us. It will be kind of another part of a discovery process. As you mentioned, you find some interesting target thanks to machine learning, and then you went back into the data, and you analyzed them, and you, uh, you discovered that uh, this was, you validated the result. So the, the computer is like an help, something that helps you, like a grad student or a postdoc, or, but faster and, and cheaper. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, the floor is open for questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please come down to the microphone. And um, I'm going to start with a, a question, Jeff, that I think comes up a lot because, of course, this is a binary problem, planet or not a planet. Um, I think some people here might be curious as to how, what, what is the validation process? So you say, well, I mean, we, we've seen in, in the right. data sets you showed us tonight light curves which look remarkably the same. And in one case, it's a planet, and in another, yeah. it isn't. Maybe you could comment a little bit on how um, planet the, discoveries are. are yeah, that, well, that's, that's an absolutely critical aspect of this discovery process because uh, uh, Kepler and TESS are just these survey missions trying to see whatever signals we can get out there. But just because Kepler or TESS detects something doesn't mean it's really a planet. So, so most of that is background-based observations, follow-up observations to see is, this, is there something else that's looking like a transit that really isn't. Many times it would be a background object. Uh, there are cases where you can statistically look at a, uh, the, the systems on their own and, and statistically say 95 or 99% are, are, are going to certainly be planets, but you can't necessarily say this one's a planet. You're just saying 99% are or something. Um, so, but but th the basic answer is follow-up observations, ground-based observations. Okay. Um, so you said you trained on 15,000? So that seems like a small number to me. Did you do, quote, data augmentation or some other scheme to generate more data? Yeah, so um, 15,000 is uh, definitely small on the scale of the machine learning models that we usually train. Um, the, the one data augmentation trick we used was we took all the lie curves and we reversed them. Um, and so that, in, in that way, we were able to double our training data um, to about 30,000. Yeah. Then you flip um, them too, and that's another <laughs> doubling. No, it didn't, didn't, didn't go upside down. But um, we, 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 we reversed them left to right. Um, and, you know, we, we, were, we were unsure whether, whether those 15,000 would be enough. Um, but we, we kept our model relatively small compared to um, some of the other big models that, that we use on those, uh, you know, data sets of like over a million training examples. And, you know, we found our model to be fairly accurate. Still, yeah. Yeah. And, and you had a measure of, of error in the training set in the first place. I mean, it's not perfect data, right? So people will goof and they see a planet where there's none and they see no planet where there is. So how did you handle that? Sure, yeah. So it's, it's certainly true that, that some of the um, examples in our training set may have been mislabeled. Um, what we did was we held out uh, a portion of our training data, 10%. And we did not show that um, portion to our model at all during training. And then to, to test how accurate our model was, we, uh, once we trained our model, we uh, evaluated it on that 10%. And we found it got 96% accuracy, which, which we thought was pretty good. Um, it does not mean that if we then use that same model and go searching for these through these weaker signals that it's also going to be 96% accurate because a lot of the signals that our model trained on were very strong signals. So it's unclear exactly how accurate it is um, on the, the weaker signals. But we, we believe it's, it's, it's quite accurate on, the, on its training data. Go ahead. Uh, you had mentioned that you're using a simulator to simulate the uh, test spacecraft mm -hmm. that you're then using to train models. Do, are there any plans to after the spacecraft's launch, basically uh, take some real data and compare it and use that to tweak the simulator and... and I uh, certainly, I mean, there's, our simulator is, is based on our experience with Kepler and there's big differences between the two. So we don't know if what we're simulating is exactly right, like thermal equilibrium uh, period, the time to get thermal equilibrium and things like that could be completely different. In fact, it probably is because it's much smaller. And we think we scaled it right, but we don't really know. So uh, we have a lot of, 
algorithms in the pipeline that are tuned kind of well, and we don't want to spend too much time tuning it to the simulated data because once we get real flight data, things are going to be different. So uh, there's, there's certainly lots of opportunities to look at the real data and figure out what we got wrong in the simulator. Thank you for the talk. Um, so I wanted to ask, now that we're using AI and machine learning models to like, predict uh, planets, um, is there any uh, or are there any changes that you made to the kind of data that you're gathering or uh, any changes to the procedure in which you want to gather data? Uh, well, I have ideas. Uh, even though technically there's aspects of machine learning and there's a couple things, there's technically an unsupervised learning method that's used in the pipeline and a couple other things, uh, there's nothing like deep learning or something like that that's in there. And I have ideas of ways we could incorporate it in and to aid in the actual processing instead of instead of just simply taking the products and classifying them. So there's certainly opportunities there. I have one question for Jeff and one for Chris, or uh, Jeff. Um, in a lot of the sample curves that you were showing to, to, to uh, illustrate how difficult the problem actually is, uh, some of them looked very noisy and others, and some of the noisy ones said planet and others said no planet and some of them looked a lot like planets and they said no planet. So I wonder if you could possibly just elaborate a little bit on how the humans uh, make these distinctions when to the untrained observer yeah. the light curves uh, are either uh, content free or uh, f would fool you into thinking as a planet. And then uh, for you, Chris, right? the uh, question is what it was interesting that you had the curves at multiple scales being fed in to the bottom layer. Um, were you feeding the raw curves or the calibrated curves with all these artifacts removed? And were you feeding in the whole really year-long light curves or were you folding them? And if you folded them, how did you figure out where to fold them or did you just try everything? Okay, uh, well, th those are both excellent questions. Um, the uh, what I'm showing you is just the light curve, and there's actually all kinds of supporting information, and there's actually, for every individual planet that we look at, there's upwards of 100 pages of information in these DV reports. And so, uh, a, if I showed all the information and I went through it all, I'm not sure about every single one of those, but some of them we could identify, ah, that's a background object. Or we have these statistical tests, there's this bootstrap test that uh, determines if if the detection is indistinguishable from random noise. And the one that I showed that was indistinguishable, that was actually random noise, our bootstrap statistic actually fired off saying, this looks like noise. So I, I, I'm kind of being you know, mischievous here by just showing the light curve. We actually have a lot of information, but all that information takes a lot of time to go through. And that's kind of the key here, is you gotta go through 100 pages of information to determine if you really think it's such a planet, and a, a machine could do that a lot faster. Could follow up observations? Were they involved? Were they, they, well, they are, in real life they are. I mean, these were simulated. Um, but yeah, this, this was what I showed. The light curves at the end were all simulated. So, so I knew the truth. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so to answer your questions, um, we used the uh, calibrated light curves. Um, we did some processing to um, flatten away any of the, the stellar variability. Um, in the images I showed of the uh, transits, um, we did, in fact, phase fold. We knew where to phase fold because everything in our training set was uh, an existing detection. So we knew where the detection was uh, and what its period was. Um, and so that's how we, we phase folded everything in our training set. Um, when it came to using our model on uh, new data, um, we needed to... Uh, first run an algorithm to um, actually come up with candidates to, to feed our model. So our model didn't then go and just look at raw Kepler data. We first ran um, a, a first pass detection algorithm to come up with candidates. I think we came up with um, something in the range of 500 candidates. And then we used our, our model to um, predict the probability that each of those 500 candidates was a planet. And uh, almost all of them, it said no. And then there was, um, I think, only eight or nine that it predicted um, you know, were probably planets. And then 
uh, Andrew, who's the uh, astronomer in, in this project, went through and, and looked at them and, and decided he was, he was very certain that two of them were planets. So those are the ones that we validated. Okay. Well, it's time to uh, end yeah, this. One question? All right, one. Go ahead. Uh, it's 8.10 already. So um, I have a question about uh, now training. Now, with you, with uh, since Kepler and TESS have uh, spatial and temporal resolution differences, will you be able to use Kepler data to train uh, for test detections? So um, this is a, a, a question about, I guess, domain transfer. So we see this sometimes when, you know, if we have uh, an image classification model and we train it on images pulled from um, Tumblr, and then we have images from um, like a different website, Flickr, or something like that, it turns out that um, even though both websites just have photos, a model trained on one of those data sets uh, does like significantly worse on the other data set if you don't take um, some sort of like recalibration mm -hmm. into account. So it is possible um, to take a model trained on Kepler data and um, start with that and we would do something like um, try and fine tune it um, to then uh, apply it to test data. But I would not think that uh, it would be very successful if we, if we simply took the Kepler model and applied it to the, t to the test data. And then how long uh, w processing time did the 680 pl uh, star stars take? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So Andrew actually ran uh, the, the pipeline to, to do the detections. Um, and so I think, I think that took him uh, several weeks to come up with the 500 candidates. But once we had the 500 candidates, um, the model, uh, you know, uh, goes through all of those very quickly in like, you know, minutes. Minutes. Yeah. And you're able to distribute that across your uh, Google cluster? It's possible, yeah. But, uh, you know, the funny thing about this model is it, it does train on a standard desktop computer in about an hour, an hour and a half. And, um, and then, you know, you can use it to, um, to generate new predictions in seconds. And a uh, so uh, quick plug that I will be releasing all of this code uh, next Wednesday. So uh, anyone will be able to try and try that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Uh, so you're going to work together, I have the feeling. Or maybe you <laughs> should. So just as, as a reminder of that, you should work together. You're going to have this wonderful awesome. city cup. This is the reason I did when this. When you get your coffee, think about it. Think about it. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank so you. much for being here. Thank you.